Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for part two of the Financial Literacy Workshop Series, Keeping Red Foxes in the Black. Tonight's session will discuss investment, retirement, and insurance planning. My name is Bobby Sue Teletasi, and I work in the Advancement Office here at Marist College. We are coming to you tonight live from the Canavino Library. During tonight's session, we invite you to use the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen to ask any questions you might have on the material being covered. Our speakers have set aside the final 30 minutes of this presentation to answer your questions. However, any questions not answered during the presentation will be answered via email following the presentation. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce this evening's speakers. Brian Hawhey is an Assistant Professor of Finance here at Marist and also runs the New Student Investment Center. He is a Chartered Financial Analyst and Financial Risk Manager. Brian has worked in the securities industry for over 20 years, most recently as a consultant to investment management firms. Phil LaRocco is a professional lecturer of accounting here at Marist. He is a certified public accountant and financial planner. Phil's prior work experience varies from a small accounting firm in New York City to a Fortune 500 company. And Phil has owned and operated a small accounting practice in Wallkill, New York since 1985. The Advancement Office would like to thank both Brian and Phil for sharing their time and expertise with all of us this evening. We'd also like to offer a special thank you to Rob Egan from Academic Technology for making this webinar possible. A brief disclaimer before we begin this evening's workshop. This presentation was prepared for educational purposes only. It is not a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment product, and should not be used solely to make financial decisions or investments. You should consult your financial and tax advisors before engaging in any transaction. At this point, I'll turn it over to Brian and Phil for part two of Keeping Red Foxes in the Black. Thanks, Bobby Sue. So this is Brian. I'm going to talk about investing, and then Phil will continue on talking about retirement planning uh, and insurance. So what is investing? Investing is how you make your money grow or appreciate so that you can achieve your long-term financial goals. So why do we invest? Well, it's in order to have the money for a major purchase in the future, like a house, or to do something in the future, like enjoy a comfortable retirement. We might have a pension and perhaps Social Security when we re retire, but it's a good idea to plan on having our own source of income when we do retire. Saving in the bank is a form of investing, but the return, in the form of the interest that we get paid, it's not very high. Instead, people usually invest in the stock market or in the bond market. Now, some people use the word investment when they talk about their baseball card collection or a classic car that they own or their wine collection, etc. And that can be okay, but it should only be a supplement to assets in, for example, the stock market. So we're going to ignore these collectibles when we talk about investments. So when should you start investing? After all, retirement is years away, right? Well, the sooner you start to do it, the better because the cost of your retirement doubles every five to seven years. And let me repeat that. The cost of retiring doubles about every five to seven years. For example, let's suppose that you're 20 and you start investing $5,000 a year. That's about 400 bucks a month. If you earn 10% a year in the stock market, which is the long-term average return, then in 45 years, when you hit 65, your investment will be worth $4.3 million. On the other hand, if you were to wait seven years until you're 27, you'll have to put in not $5,000 a year, but $10,000 a year every year to have the same sum of retirement. And at higher returns, the period to double is even less. So if you were able to make 15% a year in the market, you'd have to double your payments if you waited five years. 
In fact, we have a rule for this. It's called the rule of 72. If you divide 72 by the number of percent that you can make on an investment, it tells that you the number of years to double your money. So at 10%, 72 divided by 10 is 7, and 72 divided by 15 is about 5. So again, at 15%, if you wait five years to start your retirement planning, you're going to have to put in twice as much as somebody who started the five years earlier. So if you only remember one thing from tonight's webinar, remember this. The earlier you start to invest for retirement, the better. You'll thank us in years to come when you're sitting on the beach enjoying those drinks with umbrellas in them. So the question is, where should you invest? And usually it's going to be in the stock market or the bond market or both. And what is the stock market? Well, that's where you buy shares in a company like in McDonald's or Disney or Google. As the company grows and makes more profits over the years, the stock price or the price of each share in the company tends to increase. And if you sell a share for more than you paid for it, then you make a profit. And we call that a capital gain. Some companies will also take part of their profits out and pay them as cash dividends to each shareholder. And if that happens, it's a good idea to use this dividend to buy more shares in the company. This is called reinvesting your dividends. So in the long run, the stock market has been the best vehicle for investing. But there are risks. First of all, a company can go bankrupt, and your shares could end up worthless. But realistically, that's not really a big risk if you invest in big, well-known companies like Coke, GE, IBM, etc. It is true that even a big company can be affected by something bad happening, like a product recall or a lawsuit. But the mitigant to that is to invest in not just one stock, but in a group or a basket of stocks. And usually been in about 20 or 30 stocks provides decent diversification. It's also true that sometimes, like we saw in 1987 or 2000 or 2007, the entire market can crash. It can lose 20% or even 50%. But the important thing to remember is that generally the market comes back within a few years. And so this short-term crash is not going to be a big worry for you if you're saving for your retirement, because it's still years away. Another place to invest is in the bond market. And that's where, in effect, you're lending money to companies or to the US government. And what is a bond? Well, a bond is a loan for a fixed period of time, let's say 10 or 20 or 30 years and usually at a fixed interest rate. In the long run, the bond market is less risky than the stock market, but because of that, you're not likely to earn as big a return. You're not going to get paid as much. And you can still lose money with a bond if the company goes bankrupt, although usually you're going to get a big chunk of your money back if that does happen. But bonds are also affected if interest rates go up. I mean, imagine for a minute that you lent money to your friend Joe at 5%. And then later on, you could have lent it to somebody else at 10%. Well, then the loan to Joe doesn't look quite so attractive. The same thing happens with a bond. But if you continue to hold the bond until it matures and you get your money back, then it won't have been a bad investment, just not the best investment. Another place to consider investing is in the developing or emerging markets. These are countries whose economies are growing faster than the US, and this includes uh, you might have heard of the BRIC countries. There's Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And these were popular a few years ago, although not as much now. But there's other countries, too, to look at. Uh, for example, in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam and Malaysia and Indonesia, and in Africa, for example. And these places have the potential to offer better returns than you would get in the US, but they are more volatile or riskier. So which should you invest in, the bond market? the stock market or emerging markets? Well, the answer we always give, give is uh, it depends. It depends on your risk tolerance, how much risk you can take and how much risk you want to take. If you're years away from retirement, then a setback in the stock market will probably only be a blip for you. On the other hand, if you're actually in retirement and you're living on your investments, a significant market correction could be catastrophic to your lifestyle. And if you're by nature a cautious person, then perhaps the bond market is right for you. But you have to remember, though, that your long-term growth is likely to be less with bonds than with stocks. And so you might be less likely to achieve some of your goals, maybe that house in Antigua, for example, than if you were to go completely with stocks. 
And some money managers or advisors might suggest what they call a lifestyle approach, where you invest with a formula, like for example, 100 minus your age. You put that percentage in stocks and the rest in bonds. So if you were 25, for example, they'd recommend a 75% allocation to stocks and 25% to bonds. This, though, is purely unscientific and not what I would do personally. For young people, in general, I'd suggest looking at a combination of stocks and emerging markets. As always, however, the caveat is that everyone's situation is different, and we recommend that you speak to a professional advisor. And you can find risk profile questionnaires on the internet to help you figure out your preferences. By the way, Phil later on is going to talk about 401k plans, which are retirement vehicles. For now, let me just say that it's usually a bad idea to invest in the stock of the company that you work for. Why? Well, if the company gets into trouble and lays you off, your pension will probably lose a lot of value too, so you get a double whammy. Okay, so having said all that, how do you invest? Well, you need to open up a brokerage account to be able to buy and sell securities, that is investments like shares or bonds. If you want to do it yourself, you can look at a low-cost online brokerage firm like Interactive Brokers, for example. Or you can use a full-service firm like Merrill Lynch. And note, by the way, when you're talking to financial planners or brokers that, you know, sometimes they're not as smart or as well-informed as they think they are, and their opinions are precisely that. They may have incentives from their firms to recommend particular investments to you, so just always be a little judicious and, and careful when you're taking advice from other people, including from Phil and myself. So once you have your account, you can then buy individual stocks. But if you're going to do that, it takes a lot of work to do it well. I often say that people spend more time deciding where they're going to go on vacation or what car they're going to buy than what stock they're going to invest in. So alternatively, you can invest in a prepackaged basket of stocks in the form of a mutual fund or an exchange-traded fund, which is in the ETF. With a mutual fund, there's a manager, and he picks or she picks individual stocks, buying shares in a variety of companies. Money from multiple investors is pooled, so that when you invest, in effect, you're buying a fractional interest in this collection of stocks. An ETF is similar to a mutual fund, but there are some technical differences. Generally, ETFs are usually a better way to go. By the way, there are management fees charged on both mutual funds and ETFs, with the fees on ETFs usually being a little lower. In either case, try to buy one with low fees. And if you're buying a mutual fund, just be aware of the distinction between load funds and no-load funds. Generally, you want to go to a no-load fund. The load is the commission that gets paid to a broker for the privilege of putting you in the fund. So if you, don't, if you go into a no-load fund, you're not paying a commission. So mutual funds and ETFs, well, they can be index funds where they just buy and hold shares in all the companies in a market index like the S&P 500. That's, by the way, an index of the 500 largest companies. Or they can be more actively managed, where the managers try to earn more than the index. Now, while index funds don't hit home runs, they usually come very close to the performance of the index. So, you, so what you're getting is the average return of the market. Some actively managed funds may have a spectacular year, but on the whole, many managers do worse than the index. So unless you're careful, you're better off going into an index fund or ETF. And incidentally, there are also mutual funds and ETFs that invest in the bond market, in a combination of bonds and stocks, and in emerging markets. So you've got plenty of choices. Kiplinger's magazine, which we list on our list of recommended uh, resources, that magazine gives a very good overview of what, what your available choices are. And there are also lifestyle or target mutual funds designed for people who plan to retire in a specific year. Right now it's 2013, and so there could be a fund for people planning to retire in 40 years, let's say in 2053. Such a fund will allocate some percent, let's say 30 plus the number of years to retirement, into stocks. So currently, with 40 years to go, it would have 30 plus 40, or 70 percent in stocks, 
Next year, with 39 years to go, it would invest 30 plus 39, or 69 percent in stocks, and the rest in bonds. And by retirement in 2053, it would have 30 plus zero, or 30 percent in stocks, and 70 percent in bonds. Again, personally, I'm not a huge fan of this approach, but many advisors are. And again, just reiterating my point about crashes, remember that when you're in a mutual fund or stocks or ETFs or whatever, you're investing in the long for the long term. So don't panic if the market drops. Stay invested for the long run. History shows us that's the best thing to do. So maybe some, uh, just want to mention some resources that you should, um, that I would recommend to you. The Wall Street Journal is a great newspaper to read every day. It uh, keeps you up to date with the economy and with what's going on in the market. Barron's is an excellent weekly paper that covers stocks and bonds and mutual funds and has insights from different investment advisors. The Investor's Business Daily is specifically tailored to investors. They run computer programs to identify those stocks they believe will outperform the market and they publish their list which is known as the IBD50 and its track record is excellent. Kiplinger's Personal Finance, Phil and I have both mentioned a couple of times, it provides excellent value for money. It's a monthly magazine that covers stocks and bonds, mutual funds, retirement planning, insurance and general consumer tips. And these books are just a representative list of the myriad out there. The O'Neill book is written by the publisher of the Investor's Business Daily and in the book he describes the approach that they use to generate their list. Incidentally, it's based in part on the experiences of Nicholas Darvis, the author of How I Made Two Million in the Stock Market. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Phil, and he's going to continue on talking about uh, retirement planning and insurance. <coughs> Brian, uh, Brian, I'd just like to ask you one question. Um, a lot of times when people start a job and they can sign up for a 401k, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, uh, they get a list of funds that they can invest in, and they're classified as income funds, growth funds, and then there's the last one, aggressive growth funds and bond funds. Could you just describe the difference between these income and aggressive growth funds? Sure. Absolutely. Income funds are uh, predominantly invested in the bond market, so uh, or sometimes in stocks that pay a lot of dividends, and they're really tailored for people who are very close to retirement or in retirement who need a consistent steady stream of income that they can live on. So those usually I would not recommend for people starting out. And those, those would be some of the more conservative funds available. At the other end of the extreme, we have growth and aggressive growth funds. And these funds are designed not to pay current income, but rather uh, they're designed to invest in those firms that are expected to grow significantly over time. So you can imagine, you know, for example, that, that it's two th the year 2000 or 2005, and you have the opportunity to invest in a company like Apple. Well, that would have been a great decision because Apple grew tremendously over the next 10 years. So an aggressive growth fund will target these, fu these stocks that are in companies that are expected to grow aggressively. And for somebody with 10, 20, 30, 40 years to retirement, those are a great place to invest, in my opinion. Uh, why don't I like lifestyle funds? That, that's a very good question. In part, it's because there's a common uh, perception that the bond market is, is a uh, good place to be and that it's the only place to be if you want to um, invest in safe, steady income. Uh, I, do, I do completely agree that in retirement, uh, you need to have a source of income coming in. Um, but I also think that even in retirement, you know, we may live significantly longer than we expect, so we should have some of our assets invested in, um, in equities in, in, and in, in growth equities that are, that are going to continue to appreciate. But the reason that I particularly don't like the bond market right now is because interest rates are exceedingly low. They're at, at historical all-time lows and are likely to stay low for you know, the, certainly the next few years. You can invest in a 10-year treasury bond, for example, pays less than 3% interest. On the other hand, you can invest in a 
blue chip company like maybe Coca-Cola or Hershey's or a company like that and earn dividends of you know maybe two three percent but the key difference between a company investing in a company that pays dividends versus investing in a, uh, a bond is that if it's a good quality company it is likely based on their history that those dividends are going to continue to increase so that in five or ten years time your effective yield is not just a three percent two or three percent that you signed up for your yield could be five ten twenty percent significantly more than you're getting in the bond market so that's my personal choice would be to go for a mixture of uh, equity growth funds in retirement and dividend paying stocks okay thank you Brian uh, I'm going to pick up where Brian left off, but I'm going to be talking about retirement accounts. And uh, so I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing the different retirement accounts that are available today. Based on the types of investment Brian spoke about briefly, you should have a good basis as to where you should invest your retirement money. I'd like to talk about two categories of retirement accounts and how they work. Most retirement plans fall into one of two categories a defined benefit plan or a defined contribution plan. A defined benefit plan is a pension plan usually funded entirely by the employer and based on a formula that will allow annuity type payments for the retirement years. For example, some local governments will have a formula based on the number of years worked and will average annual earnings to calculate a retirement benefit that could be 50 percent of the average annual wages for life. The problem with defined benefit plans is that each year an actuary has to determine the contribution amount to fund the pension plan. The employer has an ongoing obligation to fund the plan. If you have been reading the newspapers this past summer, you would have seen that the city of Detroit is filing for bankruptcy. Part of the reason they are bankrupt is for the unfunded pension obligations from defined benefit plans that were never properly funded. Detroit is not the only city or local government that has pension obligations that are unfunded. It is estimated that trillions of dollars in unfunded pension obligations of state and local governments exist and will never be fully funded. In the 1970s and 80s, many large corporations such as IBM offered defined benefit plans to their employees. As the cost of these plans started to affect their bottom lines, corporations decided to make um, to, to make changes to a defined contribution plan. Now, what is a defined contribution plan? Well, a defined contribution plan does not guarantee a fixed benefit at retirement. Instead, both employers and employees contribute an amount to each employee's retirement account. And depending on how the dollars are invested, that's what Brian was talking about, depending on how those dollars are invested will determine how much money will be available at retirement. With a defined contribution plan, the employer's obligation ends with the contribution. Today, you will generally find defined benefit plans mainly in governments and unions. Most large corporations offer defined contribution plans. Based on Brian's explanation of the different types of funds, and since the majority of you will be covered under a defined contribution plan, the greater the return on the contributions will determine how much you will have available at retirement. Now here's a fact. <clears throat> it's estimated that Social Security will only cover up to 40% of your retirement, and that's if it's there for you. So you have to come up with that additional 60% at retirement. In webinar one, I spoke about retirement budgeting, the amount you will need each year in retirement. And I indicated that financial planners assume that you will live to age 90. The reason it is assumed you will live to age 90 is to, be sure, is to be sure most people do not run out of retirement funds during retirement. I'm going to speak briefly about the history of IRAs and then I'm going to distinguish between traditional IRAs and a Roth IRA. I'm going to give a little history so just bear with me for a few minutes. I think it's important you understand where these IRAs came from because they're the forerunners for the 401k plans, the 403Bs, and the 457 plans that I will uh, uh, define in a little while. In 1974, because Congress wanted to protect and enhance retirement funds, they established comprehensive standards for employee benefit plans. This was called the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA. 
In addition to creating standards for employer pension plans, the Act also created the Individual Retirement Account, or IRA. Back in the 1970s, there were concerns that Social Security was in trouble, as it is today, and that individuals should not rely solely on Social Security for retirement. This new IRA served two purposes. Number one, it gave individuals not covered by pension plans an opportunity to save for retirement in a tax-deferred account available through private financial institutions. And two, was to give retiring workers or individuals changing jobs a means to preserve employee-sponsored retirement plan assets by rolling them over into a tax-deferred IRA. Now let me define what tax-deferred is. The term tax-deferred means that income taxes are postponed until a later date. The initial IRA in 1974 enabled individuals to contribute a maximum of $1,500 of their earned gross income into an IRA. This amount would reduce annual taxable income and was only available to individuals not covered by a qualified employer pension plan. In 1981, ERISA was modified by the 1981 Economic Recovery Act. The change to IRAs was that all individuals under age 78 and a half whether covered by an employee-sponsored pension plan or not, were eligible to contribute. Additionally, it raised the limit of the contribution to $2,000 and allowed an additional $250 for a non-working spouse. In 1986, Congress decided to add income limits to determine eligibility for IRA contributions of those individuals that were covered by an employer-sponsored pension plan. In 1996, the contribution amount for non-working spouse was increased from 250 to 2000. In 1997, the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997 was one of the most revolutionary acts for retirement savings in history. A new IRA was created, a Roth IRA, which I will explain shortly, and income thresholds for IRA contributions for those individuals covered by employer-sponsored pension plans were increased. If you remember one thing from tonight's presentation, it's a Roth. In 2001, the Economic Growth and Re Tax Relief Reconciliation Act gave those individuals over age 50 a chance to make catch-up contribution. So that is my brief history of the IRA. And now I'd like to explain the difference between a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA. <clears throat> so you might be saying to yourself, well, what's the big difference? Well, let's say an individual is eligible to contribute to an IRA. The most that an individual under age 50 could contribute in 2012 was $5,000. If the amount was put into a traditional IRA, the taxable income on the individual's tax return would be reduced by $5,000 and there would be a current tax savings. As the $5,000 grows, interest, dividends, and appreciates over the years, this income is tax deferred, which means the tax is postponed until the money is withdrawn from the IRA, usually at age 59 and a half or later, to avoid a penalty. Well, let's just say that that $5,000 in the traditional IRA grows to $15,000 at age 59 and a half. When the $15,000 is withdrawn, it becomes taxable income and is subject to income tax. So here's the difference with a Roth. With a Roth IRA, the initial $5,000 contribution would not reduce your taxable income in the year of the contribution. But none of the $15,000 withdrawn at age 59 and a half or later would be subject to any income tax. So that's the major difference between a traditional and a Roth. It's, it's the amount that's subject to tax when the individual removes the initial contribution and the appreciation. Now here's the question, is a Roth a better deal than a traditional IRA? In other words, am I better off getting that tax break now and worry about taxes later on? Well, well, no one knows what taxes will be when the money is withdrawn. The general consensus is that people under the age of 50 today would probably be better off with a Roth. Brian mentioned briefly a 401k plan and I'm going to try to describe what a 401k, 403b, and a 457 is. And basically, they're very similar. If you understand the difference between a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA, 
you will then understand how defined contribution plans work. Defined contribution plans are listed as a 401k for public and private companies, a 403b for a not-for-profit organization such as Marist College, and a four, as a 457 plan for governments. In 2013, you can contribute up to $17,500 into one of these plans if you are under age 50, or up to $23,000 if you are 50 or older. With some of these plans, usually the 401k and the 403b, employers make additional contributions on your behalf. Now let me just explain what these terms are. The terms 401k, 403b, and 457 are internal revenue code sections that created these defined contribution plans. Companies can amend their plans to make these plans the equivalent of a Roth IRA where the contributions are after tax but withdrawals tax free. Not all plans offer the Roth option. Let me review again the tax consequences of these retirement plans. An individual contributing to a traditional IRA or one of the defined contribution plans mentioned above receives an immediate tax deduction either reflected on their tax return as an IRA or on their pay stub for the defined contribution plans. So let, let's just focus on a 401k plan. Let's say your salary is $50,000 a year and you decide to contribute 5% or $2,500 into your 401k. On your W-2, your wages are reflected not as $50,000 but as $47,500 and the federal and most state taxes are based on the lower figure. While you may have contributed $2,500, your net take-home pay may only reflect a reduction of $2,200 because the federal and state withholding taxes are lower. So while you may be contributing $2,500, your out-of-pocket cash would be less. And again, your contribution plus earnings appreciation grows tax deferred and is taxed when withdrawn, usually at age 59 and a half or later. With an IRA, however, you will receive your tax benefit in the form of a reduction of taxable income on your personal tax return. Now that's a traditional. Well, what about these Roth plans? Well, with the Roth plan, there is no current benefit. If you contribute to a 401k, your net pay will, re will be reduced dollar for dollar. These contributions are after tax. Again, the advantage of the Roth plans is that the initial contribution grows tax deferred and the withdrawals of the initial contribution and earnings are 100% tax-free when withdrawn. Remember the example that Brian gave you. I believe he said investing $5,000 a year at age 20-something would grow to possibly $4 million. Can you imagine having $4 million at age 65 of which it is all tax-free? I know this was a very brief introduction to retirement plans, but I would urge the Marist Young alumni to consider a Roth IRA or a Roth defined contribution plan. Now, I'm going to reiterate some of the points that Brian made about investing. And um, so the first thing I think you have to do is know your investment personality. I call it investment personality. There's other terms for it. There are two things you have to do for retirement. You have to make contributions no matter how small, and I'm going to show you a little example at the end, each pay period. So you have to make contributions each pay period, and you must invest in funds that have the potential to appreciate. If you refer to webinar number one, uh, when I was talking about budgeting, I reiterated a few times that you must pay yourself first whenever you budget, and that's what I'm talking about here. Put something away for your retirement. If you are the type of individual who checks the stock market each day to see if they have gained or lost any money, then you probably have a conservative investment personality. You have to remember this. Investing in the stock market has its ups and downs, as Brian has mentioned. But generally, over any 10-year period, the market has consistently outperformed fixed types of investments such as bonds and certificates of deposits. And here's a common mistake made by investors when they see the stock market declining. So let's say individuals have put money into their 401k, and let's say they put it into a stock fund. Well, when the market goes down, they tend to take their money out of the stocks and put it into fixed income. 
And then when the market goes back up, they get back into the stocks. And by doing that, they have guaranteed that they definitely will have losses on those investments. My philosophy and the philosophy of a young individual should be this. Over the 30 or 40 years your retirement funds are invested in the stock market, the market will go up and will go down, but always in a net upward trend over the years. When the market goes down, I look at, at that as an opportunity. And the opportunity is to purchase additional shares at a lower price, which I know from past history will again increase. My recommendation to those of you who have this fear of the market is in the beginning, when you consider the funds to invest in your retirement money, the contribution your employer makes, their defined contribution, should be put into stock funds and your funds into less riskier investments. Track both your investments and your employer's contribution over time. You will probably realize that funds in the stock market will be increasing over time faster than the fixed income investments. And here's a rule of thumb. The rule of thumb is that the percentage of retirement savings money that, you sh that, that should be in the stock market is 100 minus your age. So if you're 50 years old, the, the rule of thumb is that 50% of your investments should be in the stock market. If you're 70 years old, 30%. And that just reiterates what Brian had mentioned. No matter at what age you are, you should, still should have some money invested in stocks. Uh, again, I would endorse Kiplinger's personal finance, which Brian mentioned. Each month to stay current with the current trends in personal finance. Now let's look briefly at my last slide here. And, um, and I said to you, start early no matter what the amount is. And here we have a situation where we have Mary Red Fox. She graduated from Marist and got her first job. So Mary is 25 years old and has two choices. Mary can start immediately at age 25 and invest $2,000 a year. That's $38.46 each week. That's about four veal palm sandwiches over at Rossi's in Poughkeepsie. And over the number of years she will have put away over those 40 years $80,000. And again, this is what Brian was talking about. Well, what happens if she waits until she's age 45 and instead of, put, instead of putting 2000 away, she puts 4000 away? Again, she'll be putting that away and she'll still be accumulating $80,000. In both situations, Mary has saved $80,000. Well, look what happens. How much money will Mary, Mary have at age 65? Well, if she put it away at, at age 25, she'll have $241,600. If she waits until age 45 and doubles her contribution, she will have $132,264. So my recommendation is as follows. Invest early. Invest as much as you can, and the growth will be there. Uh, I believe, and as Brian has mentioned, the $4 million Everyone who's young in their 20s out there can easily retire with a million dollars by just using some simple strategy and investing in the market. Okay, Phil, that was great. Thanks. Uh, I've got a question for you. But uh, So I guess what you're telling us is uh, investing for retirement is like voting early and often, right? Well, I was, that was one of my lines. I think you're taking some of my material oh, here. But, okay. But yes. But my... I, again, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I, I used to teach over at um, Mount St. Mary College, and when you're an adjunct, they pay you basically peanuts. So every few weeks, I would get a check. Now, I was there for like 13 years, so I probably taught 30, 40, 50 classes, et cetera. And the paychecks were like maybe $120 every two weeks, to, you know, maybe 150 Now, some people would call that, what, chump change? And say, well, it's not, it's not worth investing. Well, I never took one of those dollars over those years. I invested it. I had the money go directly to a brokerage house, and I put it into an aggressive growth fund. Um, right now, that money, that small amount of money, is over $120,000. $120,000. And again, that's like Mary uh, putting in $38.46 each week. The money grows with the compounding. Okay. And one last, one last question. I know that Bobby Sue has got some, but, but uh, I've got one. You mentioned, when we talked about 401ks, you mentioned matching contribution. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, a lot of times uh, 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 with a defined contribution plan, 
the company has to contribute so much money, and it has to do with the federal regulations. Now, the money that the company puts in, and I noticed there was a question there, any money the company puts in is tax-free. It doesn't get added to your W-2. But when you take that money out when you retire, it, it will be tax taxable. But th does it mean that even if I don't put any money in, the company is still going to put no. this cash in? The way they works with a company, they require you. For example, at Marist College, I believe the way it works here with a 403B, I have to put in 4%. Marist College puts in 7%. So that's 7% free money, but if I don't put my 4% in, I lose it. Well, it, 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 the plan that we have here at Marist, you don't have a choice. You have to put the 4% in, so it, it, they're not flexible. Okay, on, on the uh, limits, I have a chart here because I knew somebody would ask this question. Um, let me just find it here. I brought the chart. Um, Roth IRA, just give me one second. So here are the limitations. So for a Roth IRA, there are certain income thresholds. So for example, if you're single, the contribution to a Roth IRA is phased out between $112,000 and $127,000. They call it modified adjusted gross income, but let's just assume it's adjusted gross income. If you file a joint return, a Roth IRA is phased out between 178 and 188. Now, when I say phased out, that means when you get to the 188, you cannot make a contribution to a Roth IRA. Married filing separately, that's 10,000 and um, et cetera. So those are the, the income threshold limitations. So, Phil, if I'm working somewhere and I have a 401k or a, or a 403b, can I still, if I meet the income eligibility, can I still contribute to a Roth IRA? It depends. Again, if you're covered by a pension plan, if you're covered by a pension plan, there are, there are other income thresholds. And, and I, instead of getting tied down with numbers here, what we could probably do, since I have a chart here, we could ask Bobby Sue if we could post this at the end of the, um, at the, end of the webinar and then that information will be available to all to see. Okay, I have, we're going to get our next uh, question. You want me to continue, Bobby? I have a few other things to talk about insurance. Okay, let's, then let's do them. The question is, should I max out my traditional 401k before maxing out a Roth, before using a Roth? Um, what do you think, Brian? Um, well, it, uh, I, w I would want to make sure that I'm getting, I'm able to avail the full maximum contribu matching contribution from the employer. That would be the very first thing. Right. Uh, but generally, uh, you know, if you're expecting to get good returns in the marketplace, right, then the benefit of the tax free of the tax free payout is going to be significantly more, I think, than you, you know, than than the current income you'd save uh, with the with the 401k. So personally, I'd, I'd max out the all other things been equal and depend on the eligibility limits. I would go for the Roth uh, first. You know, there's a lot of companies that have both a 401k traditional, uh, I'll use that term, and a 401k Roth. So I, I think the question would be is to go to your human resources and find out if they're going to have a Roth coming up in the future, or maybe they do and you're just not aware of it. Bobby Sue. Yes, th th there's a maximum amount. For example, yeah. oh, the question is, will the IRS allow you to do both a Roth and a traditional IRA? Well, here's, here's how I answer the question. Assuming you can contribute uh, to a Roth IRA because of the income threshold, or, and assuming you can contribute to a traditional IRA because there are limitations, uh, if you're 50, uh, under 50, you can contribute $5,000 a year to an IRA. It could be any combination you want. You could put 3000 into a traditional, 2000 into a Roth, etc. But you cannot put more than $5,000. If you're over 50, like Brian is, you could put an additional $1,000. Um, I'll go on. Yeah, the question is, is a pension plan and an IRA the same thing? Well, a pension plan generally um, today, if you're talking about a defined benefit plan, that is a pension plan. That's the one I spoke about that governments and unions have. 
So that's different than an IRA. Now, let me just explain this, maybe because I, we ha we're doing an overview here. An individual retirement account is generally purchased, or it was purchased in the past, by people who did not have a company-sponsored plan. It was given, people were given the opportunity to make investments into retirement plans, which prior to the Act, the ERISA Act, they could not do. So a pension plan and an IRA are totally separate things. Is it possible to put it into both? Yes. Are there income thresholds? Yes. And again, once I post the chart, you'll be able to see that. What are, what are the options of rolling a 401k into an IRA? Um, I'll, I'll take this and then Brian can handle it. Well, first of all, if you're still working for a company, you probably can't touch the 401k. Usually, and in most cases, and again, every plan is different, the only way you're going to get your 401k money, because your 401k, and it's something I didn't mention, all of these defined contribution plans are portable. Well, what does that mean? Well, as I go from one job to the other, the money follows me. So the only way you're going to get money out of, generally, out of a 401k, 453, uh, 457, 403b, is when you leave the company. At that point, generally, you have an option. I can leave the money with the company in the whatever, wherever they're investing it, maybe through Wells Fargo, et cetera, or I can take a rollover into an IRA. But you've got to be careful. If I have a 401k traditional, and I, and I try to roll it over into a Roth IRA, I'm going from non-taxable to taxable. The money would be completely taxable when I rolled it over into a Roth IRA. So I can't go from a traditional to a Roth rollover without paying some income tax consequences. Yeah, but just to follow up on that, generally if you're young, uh, it's still well worthwhile making that. You just need to be aware that there will be a, a taxable hit but it's well worth doing if you've still got many, many years to retirement. Uh, and you know, it's probably beyond the scope of this discussion, but I'll just be aware that when you have money in an IRA, you have the option of having it self-directed where you can invest in assets other than just the stock market and uh, the bond market. That's a self-directed IRA. I see there's a question from Lowell. It says, I work for the government. Uh, I'm sorry, Lowell. And I participate in a 457k plan. Only joking, Lowell. Don't get mad at me. It says, how would I go about opening a Roth IRA through a brokerage firm? Well, remember, I don't know what your income is. You got to be you got to be sure that you can contribute to a Roth IRA. But yes, you can open it through a brokerage firm. You can do it online, etc. But just again, you're going to have to talk to someone. You don't want to open up something that you may not be entitled to. Okay, so I'm going to move on to my next topic, it's, it'll be very brief, and insurance planning. Okay, so the question is, what is insurance? Well, if you understand what the definition is, then you'll know what we're doing. It says, insurance is a form of risk sharing. For a fee, which is called a premium, the insurance company will share the loss with you. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on this final slide speaking about life insurance and how it fits into your financial plan. Okay, well how does life insurance fit into my financial plan? And again, for those of you that were there for the webinar one, I had mentioned that uh, in your financial plan things may come up with family issues. So let's just say that you're single and you have no liabilities. Do, I need, do you need life insurance? The answer would be probably not. But let's just take another situation. Let us say that you are married have a few kids, own a home with a mortgage, and you are the main source of income for your family. Question, what happens if you die? Who is going to pay the mortgage, support your spouse and children, pay for a college education, etc.? Well, here is where life insurance comes into play. If you have an adequate amount of life insurance and with the proper planning, your family will be able to attain the above goals. A financial planner can assist in determining the proper amount of life insurance with the, assistance of an insu with the assistance of an insurance agent. Now obviously, if both spouses work, the amount of life insurance needed will be reduced. So let, us, let me ex briefly explain the two main types of life insurance. There's whole life, which is also called permanent life insurance, and term insurance. 
whole life insurance is life insurance with an investment component. It is expensive since it has that investment component and a cash surrender value, which means the contributions you make or the premiums you pay at a certain point, you can cash it in. The question is, do you need a whole life insurance policy if you have an IRA or 401k where you are currently investing your money? In my opinion, the answer is no. Term insurance, on the other hand, is insurance for the period with no investment component and no cash surrender value. Its cost is based on your age and current health. My recommendation is you consider term insurance to be part of your financial plan. The cost of term insurance is significantly less than whole life. If you are young, like myself, 30 years old, and in relatively good health, you can probably purchase a $2 million term insurance policy for less than $1,200 a year. A whole life policy would probably cost upwards of $3,500 or more for the same amount of life insurance coverage. As you get older, the cost of term insurance will increase. But as your children get older, the amount needed is reduced so your premiums will remain about the same with the smaller policy. The rule of thumb is that you should have somewhere between five to ten times your annual salary in life insurance. Again, this is just an estimate. The factors to be considered are as follows. Does your spouse work outside the home? What is the age of your children? What are your debts? What about the education funding for your children? What about the retirement for your stay-at-home spouse in the event something happens to you? Again, before making any financial decisions, speak to a professional. Question. Do you need life insurance for your children? Answer, probably not, but for a rider on your life insurance policy, you can probably cover them. Now here's an interesting one that always pops up. Does that stay-at-home spouse need life insurance? Probably yes. It is estimated that the cost to replace a stay-at-home spouse when considering young children would be somewhere around $450,000 over the years. Just think about it. What does a stay-at-home parent do? Transporting kids, cooking, laundry, little league, soccer camp, and being at home when children return from school. If you had to hire someone to do these jobs, what would it cost? So while the $450,000 appears to be high, a 500,000 term life insurance for a few hundred dollars spent for a few hundred dollars appears to be money well spent. I believe the best value for your dollar is term insurance. Policies can be purchased in 10-year increments where you lock in the premium. Remember, as you get older, the, the amount of life insurance needed declines. Having said that, I, re I would recommend speaking with an insurance agent before you decide. Questions? And thank you. Well, the... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Can I... Can I contribute to a Roth IRA before my income passes the IRS threshold? The IRS threshold is based on annual earnings. So therefore, they look at your tax return when you file it. So if you're saying that I won't pass the threshold until September, can I put it in before that? No. They look at annual. Now remember this. For an IRA, you have until April 15th of the following year to contribute. So for example, for 2013, you have until April 15th to contribute to an IRA. So on December 31st, so when you get your W-2, you will know what your gross earnings are. Oh yeah, okay, the question is, uh, how much should I have invested in the stock market? I think that was what I mentioned before. And the general rule of thumb, and Brian will add to this, I'm just giving you a rule of thumb. Of, uh, investing uh, is, you know, is not really my specialty, but the general rule of thumb is 100 minus your age. So if you're 30 years old, 100 minus 30 means that 70% of your funds should be invested 
in stocks. Now, they could be in individual stocks if you're someone that can tra trace them, but in my opinion, probably in mutual funds. Brian? As I mentioned, that's a, um, that's a general rule of thumb in the market. Now, there's no real science behind it. Uh, it just gives people a nice feeling that they're... Th the general concept is that when you retire, you're, you don't re a lot of investors, a lot of advisors would say you don't want to have 100% of your money in the stock market in case the stock market were to crash 50% and you'd lose 50%, per certainly in the short term, you'd lose 50% of your assets. That's why they recommend as you get into retirement age that you've got more and more of your assets in bonds, in fixed income. On the other hand, when you're young, you're not as concerned about stock market crashes, so you can afford to take more risk. And that's why when you're young, it will be a much higher percentage in the stock market. Now, as I said, I personally would vary a, a bit from that in that I would, I would replace the bond market component with stocks that pay a dividend, that will continue paying a dividend even if the market crashes. But th that's just my personal recommendation, and as, or my personal choice. And as I say, we're not specifically making recommendations here. Okay, Brian, I, 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 can you talk about uh, rebalancing your portfolio and what that means? That's a, that's a great question, actually, and something we should have touched on. Rebalancing means that uh, if you, if your advisor, for example, or if you believe that you should be 50% in the stock market and 50% in bonds, for example. So let's say I put $50, $50 in the bond market, $50 in the stock market. A year later, Let's say the stock market has doubled. It was, it was a really good year. So my $50 in the stock market has grown to 100, and the $50 in the bond market has stayed at $50. My assets are now worth $150, but 100 of those is the stock market. So that's 100 out of 150, or about 66% is in the stock market. But I really want to have a 50-50 allocation. Therefore, I need to sell some of my stocks and move that money into the bond so, so that I would end up with $75 in the stock market and $75 in the bond market. And many financial advisors would say that that's a good thing to do. And I, I wouldn't disagree. Once you have your allocation f uh, decided upon that you, you follow that methodology because they would say if, if that had happened, if the stock market had gone up that much, maybe the stock market was overvalued. So you sell at the top, take your money out, put it in the bond market, and then if the stock market were to crash later, you could rebalance again. And you would do that on a regular basis, maybe once a year. Uh, I see there was a question. Uh, somebody wanted me to repeat something. Um, um, and again, the question was from Dale. It says, re-asking a question we missed. Can I contribute to a Roth IRA before my income passes its thresholds, or can you only do it at year end. You have to wait till year end to know what you're, and they call it not adjusted gross income, there's a term they use, modified adjusted gross income. But again, remember, you can put money into an IRA, Roth or traditional, up until April 15th of the next year. So what I tell many people to do is um, wait, do your taxes, and you know maybe you're going to get a big tax refund, which I don't recommend, but let's say somebody did. They say, you know what, I'm going to take that refund and put it into an IRA or Roth or whatever. Um, any other questions? Uh, there's a question here about what, a no, no load fund? Now, uh, well, we can't recommend anything here, but um, you know, I, I'm sure Brian will, can handle that about where you can find information. About yeah, that. I mean, uh, one, one place to look is um, is uh, Kiplinger's. So have, have a look at Kiplinger's. They do a good job of uh, commenting on, on uh, the success of, of mutual funds. I mean, one has to be a little bit careful in that a, a fund that does really well one year may or may not do really well the next year. But generally speaking, you know, there's a lot of similarity between the funds. Barron's is also a great place to look for information about, about funds. Um, but the, the, um, the main difference between load funds and no load funds is generally no load funds are sold directly by the company, like Fidelity, for example. You go to a Fidelity office, you can buy a Fidelity no load fund. 
Load funds are those with a commission, and those are ones usually that you buy um, with a uh, you buy through a through a financial planner or a broker. Remember that with exchange traded funds, uh, there's generally no load associated with them, so they're they're cheaper. And my recommendation, generally, all other things been equal, would be to go for an exchange traded fund. Okay, I see there's a question from Josh. It says. I may have missed it, but I understand the percentage split up. But how do I decide how much of my total income I should invest? Now, that's a very good question. And here's a, here's a mistake a lot of people do. Uh, they go, they read a book, and they decide to put a ton of money into their retirement fund. But then a situation arises where they want to put a down payment on a house. They don't have the money. So what I would say is that the first thing you have to do is define what your goals are. If your goal is to buy a house, then maybe you split up so much into a retirement fund and some of it not into a retirement fund. That's the best advice I could give you. And I want to mention one other thing I didn't mention here about IRAs. Uh, and this is more for more of the sophisticated investor, but there's something known as a... Um, uh, it's a directed IRA. What, what's the term, Brian? A yeah, self-directed IRA. Yeah, a self-directed IRA. Now, why do I mention what a self-directed IRA is? Well, when you have a self-directed IRA, you can make investments basically in anything. For example, generally if I have an IRA, I'm investing in a mutual fund or bonds or some sort of fund. But if I have a self-directed IRA, let's say I had $200,000 in an IRA. If I was able to transfer that to a self-directed IRA, I can now take that money and invest it. And again, you've got to be very careful with this. And I'm not giving advice. I'm just telling you, look this up. You can invest that into real estate. You could buy an apartment, not for yourself, to rent. So a self-directed IRA, which is for the more sophisticated investor and is something to do down the road, enables you to invest in other products other than uh, stocks and bonds. And just to, to follow up on that point about um, uh, save, you know, your, your, how much should you contribute to your, to your retirement savings versus you know, buying a house, you should really think in terms of your multiple goals. Um, you, may, you may be single, but you may be thinking about getting married. Uh, you may think about having, the, ultimately you'll have kids. Those kids will have to go to college. Um, you may want to save for some big vacation. So you should try and map out what your goals are going to be. Saving and investing is a great idea, but your investing doesn't all have to be in your 401k. And on the subject of, of education and saving for, edu for your children's education, one point that we should uh, address, and maybe we will in the future webinar, is a plan that's known as a 529 plan. And that's a savings vehicle specifically designed for saving for uh, children's college um, activities. Okay, I'd like to, there's a question from Stacy. It says, the focus of this webinar was retirement investing and insurance. Are there plans for other topics? Now, Stacy, I don't know if you were with us for webinar number one, but in webinar number one, uh, I spoke about uh, budgeting. Uh, Brian, what did you speak about? I, it was so long ago. Uh, credit cards and banking. Credit card debts, mortgages, etc. So there was. Now, if you send uh, your request to Bobby Sue, uh, there's other webinars. We have other people that are qualified to speak about other topics here on campus, and I'm sure we would be glad to speak about other topics, but you have to let Bobby Sue know. After you send her a check for uh, the college uh, uh, Mars fund. Oh, I, I have one last question for Brian, if I might ask. Sure. Um, you know, Brian, when people... Um, get a job and, and, and the company tells them like, after they've been there a year, they can put money into a 401k which gets matched. How do they find out if these are good funds or not funds? Isn't there a Morningstar or something? Maybe you can talk about that? Yeah, the, the, that's, a, that's a great question. And actually, we should mention, by the way, just before I answer that question, on, on the topic of, um, of giving to the college, just be aware that many employers have a matching program for charitable donations. So if you choose to make a, an, an allocation to the college, you may be able to uh, get a matching contribution from your employer. So on the subject of which funds should you pick, well, you're, you're absolutely right. Morningstar um, is an organization that, they're, they're just like the, the rating agencies, Morningstar um, are an investment um, uh, sort of rating uh, outfit. And what they do is they look at mutual funds. 
they look at the track record of mutual funds and then they, they bucket them into what they call their star ratings. So a, a five star fund, for example, would generally be uh, well organized and um, have achieved, um, you know, good, uh, tra have a successful track record. Uh, a one star fund, on the other hand, would, would not be as good. Now, note, just note that just because a fund is five stars last year it doesn't mean that it's going to outperform the market next year or even match the market. It may tend to underperform. It's, it, so you, you can't be guaranteed. But the, the very first thing I would look at over and above the Morningstar rating or any other ra rating is what fees are going to be charged. You generally want to try and pick a fund with um, well, first of all, your, your first decision is where do you want to invest? Do you want to be in the U.S. stock market? Do you want to be in bonds? Do you want to be in emerging markets? If you're in the U.S. stock market, do you want to be in these income funds? Do you want to be in growth funds, value funds, whatever? Uh, but the very first thing that, that you look at after that, once you've decided where you want to be invested in, given that there are these myriad of funds, yeah, I try and get a sense of the track record of the manager. Some managers do consistently like uh, perform very well. For example, Bill Miller at Leg Mason uh, is very famous for being a consistent investor. Uh, Peter Lynch at, at Fidelity was very, very good over the years. So try and pick a fund that maybe has got a good track record, but more importantly perhaps is what's the level of fees, what's the management fees. For an index fund, you know, you want maybe you know, 50, 25 basis points. That's a um, 0.5% or 0.25%. Actively managed funds where the manager tries to outperform the market, those will be a lot more expensive, over 1%, maybe even 2%. So you want to be, if you're paying for a fund like that, you want to be very confident that the manager is doing a good job. Uh, Brian, you may have answered this, but exactly what's the difference, I know, between a loaded fund and a no-load fund, is it that it's at more actively managed? In other words, why would someone pay a load if there is no difference? Yeah, the difference between the load and the, the no load is specifically the commission. Is there a commission being paid? And this gets back to who are you buying the fund from? If you go to Fidelity, Fidelity and you buy a fund from the Fidelity salesman, that salesman is being paid by Fidelity. Fidelity pays his salary, so that's fine. On the other hand, if you go to Morgan Stanley and you want to buy a mutual fund, you could be buying a mutual fund from let's say, for example, uh, the American Funds Group. Well, the Morgan Stanley broker is not getting paid by American Funds uh, to sell you their product. He needs to get paid a commission, therefore you're paying his commission. And that load could be 4 or 5%. It can be very, very significant. So in other words, you invest $100 in the fund, you get your statement at the end of the first month, and you'll see that only 95 or $96 has, has gone into your account. Or if you buy something called a B share, it, you, the same thing happens, four or five dollars gets taken out, but instead of being taken out up front, it gets taken out over eight years. So uh, all other things been equal, there's no point in buying a load fund where you pay the commission unless you can be very, very sure and confident that the manager is going to outperform the market and do a really good job and make it worth your while paying that commission. So all other things been equal, go for it. Usually I would say unless you really know what you're doing, go for an index fund where you, you, the manager, management fees are lower, uh, make sure it's a no load fund and Again, all other things been equal, maybe just go for an exchange traded fund that's, that's an index fund that's not actively managed. Okay, there's two more questions. There's one from Lowell, and it says, what is the tax implication if you invest in a mutual fund and then withdraw the money after, say, 18 months? Does it vary from fund to fund? Well, you got to be careful, Lowell. If you invest in a retirement fund and you take the money out, there's a 10% penalty. Okay, so if we're talking about just investing in a regular mutual fund, not in a retirement fund, not in a Roth or anything else, yeah, uh, it works like this. If I invest $5,000 and 18 months later I sell it for $5,500, I have a $500 gain. It's basically, uh, that's the general rule. And just to jump in, uh, I mentioned when I, when I discussed exchange traded funds and mutual funds, I mentioned that there were some technical differences and this actually touches on one. And it relates specifically to a mutual fund. If the mutual fund has invested in companies that have and they appreciate over time and the mutual fund uh, incurs a capital gain or, or has a capital gain, then the shareholders in the mutual fund can be liable for a tax expense. 
but unfortunately it's a little complicated in how that works. So theoretically, Phil, for example, could invest in a mutual fund on the 1st of January. That mutual fund could incur capital expenses, uh, a capital gain and be liable for tax expenses. Phil could sell the mutual fund in November, for example. I, meanwhile, could invest in that same mutual fund in uh, December. And in December, at the end of the year, even though the mutual fund no you know, has done nothing in the month of December, I can be liable effectively for the taxes um, associated with the gains that Phil has benef benefited from. So just be, just be a little bit aware of that. It's, it's, it's more complicated than, than we've time to go into today, but that's one of the advantages of an exchange traded fund or ETF over a mutual fund if you're going to be uh, going in and out uh, fairly frequently, that there can be tax complications. Okay, there's a, there's a question from Vincent DiDonato. He said, should I fund my children's education before my retirement goals are met? Now, we had that question in webinar number one, if I remember correctly. And, and my response to that one was, you can fund, you can finance your children's education. You can't finance your retirement. My recommendation would be, is you've got to put money away for retirement. You cannot finance retirement. So uh, you're going to have to make some, de uh, some decision on how you're going to do this but you can't be putting all your money into children's education and not be considering um, 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 you know, your, your retirement. And Vincent also had another question. You think that options should play a part? I think that's beyond this course, uh, th this lecture, but Brian may want to say something about it. Yeah, uh, it's really beyond the scope of what we want to talk about here tonight. Just um, w w make the point that there are, s that options, again, <laughs> whatever about, uh, I said in the last seminar that uh, that options are, are, are that um, credit cards are like chainsaws. Well, you know, options are like chainsaws uh, when you've been drinking. So you got to be, you can have a lot of fun, a hell of a lot of fun with them, but you got to be really, really careful. Uh, options can be useful for hedging your risk. In other words, protecting you against the market declining. Options can also be useful for outright speculation, and options can be useful for generating some additional income if the, if the stock market is not uh, very active at the moment. But that would be a subject, I think, for another, dis another conversation. And uh, the last question, uh, Josh has a question, Brian. I'll, let me just read it. Uh, I have a direct deposit going straight to Edward Jones. I was told it is a charge every time they receive a direct deposit. Is there a better way? But, but the, isn't that the way Edward Jones operates? Uh, I, frankly, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar specifically with uh, either the bank or Edward Jones. It could be that the bank is charging you. It could be that Edward Jones is charging you. Um, so maybe if, if that is the case, maybe you could think about um, you know, doing a less frequent um, uh, um, you know, doing a less frequent um, uh, transfer or, or, or changing broker. But generally, y you know, in the grand scheme of things, um, if it's only a couple of dollars, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. The, the important thing, as I said, is to have a disciplined, consistent, um, uh, ongoing uh, investment plan. And in the long run, in 20 or 30 years, you won't really care about the couple of dollars in, um, in, in fees. So we'd like to thank you all for participating in tonight's financial literacy workshop webinar. We hope you found it helpful and informative. Please be on the lookout for future events and webinars hosted by the Office of Alumni Relations at Marist. A recording of tonight's webinar, as well as part one, which we referenced numerous times this evening, will be available on the Marist alumni website in the very near future. You'll be notified by email once the webinars are available. Again, we'd like to thank our speakers, Phil LaRocco and Brian Hawhey, and Rob Egan from Academic Technology. And we'd like to thank all of you for joining us for part two of Keeping Red Foxes in the Black. Thanks, and have a great night.